started doing that without Nathan here. Uh, so our hymn today is It Is Well. It's a very well-known hymn, a well-known hymn, and lots of people know kind of the story behind it. If you want to grab that paper with all the text, is for the hymn. Uh, we're going to sing it first, and then we'll... Uh, and we'll talk about it. <laughs> and I'm used to being able to finger pick when I play this, so forgive me if it doesn't come out quite as cool as it should. Wait, wait, I need something. Wait. Wait a second. I know. I'm going to put it back on this. Actually, no. When the night Yeah. 
was that one? There's actually two more verses we can sing. Oh, for real? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so let's, here, let me, thank you, sir. Uh, so back to the beginning of the lyrics, make sure we understand what you say. There's obviously a lot of water imagery at the very beginning of this, for sure. Uh, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. What's he talking about? In the peace and in the, it's not peace out of the times. Yeah, so when sorrow is coming, and like sea billows roll, meaning just constant wave after wave, one after another, shows up. Uh, peace, like a river, attendeth my way. What quality of the river is he using to describe the peace? A uh, calm peace? I mean, like, a, wait, what do you mean? What, what does he mean, like, peace like a when he says peace like a river? Yeah. What's, the river never stops flowing. Unless, yeah. it, unless it dries up. Right, but so we don't have to worry about that, especially now. Usually, quite often, the the river imagery is the idea of unending. It's just always more and more and more. Yeah, you know, other people have suggested that he's talking about the ferocity of a river, and so he's saying like, when I'm not peaceful, right? When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, as in it's it's not really coming. It's just rolling. Uh, See, that's what I see is the second line when sorrows like sibilants roll. If yeah. you've ever like been in the ocean. When you've gotten swallowed a whole mouthful of salt water and it just keeps coming and you never get a chance to catch your breath, mm -hmm. that is what is more shaking. Yeah, it, you know, shakes you up or whatever. This point in these times, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well. It is well with my soul. So, no matter what's coming my way, you have shown me that. What the, the thing to say is, I trust you, it is, it's going to be okay, because the, the assumption, underlying assumption is, I'm, I'm going to see you in, in eternity, like, no matter what, that's what gives me confidence, peace, it is well. Uh, it's, it's going to be okay. Uh, so, obviously the refrain, same thing. Uh, the second verse, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. Again, what's the idea? Still, like, when certain yeah. times or bad things happen. Yeah, when the tough times come, this assurance, what assurance is going to control? Blessed assurance. Yeah, this blessed one, and it's that Christ has regarded my health, as he says, in Christ. What's buffet here? Uh... Hit up against. Oh, okay. uh, that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. So Christ's sacrifice on the cross saves my soul. Is the thing that gives him confidence through this time. Uh, well, third I verse. Helpless estate too is like I can't do anything by myself. Right, and Christ took that upon himself. Exactly. It's totally by grace. Uh, my sin... Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. So that's like an interjection. So he starts out a sentence, and then he says, before I even get to the, the end of the sentence, this is a marvelous thought. And then he repeats himself. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. So what's he saying about his sin? It's not his anymore. Yeah. Tell me. Jesus took care of it. And so the response is... Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. But that should be the, the natural response that comes from hearing the gospel, that comes from believing the message that Christ has died to pay the penalty for your sins. And then the last verse that we sang, there's two more that uh, mention sort of eternity, stuff like that. I encourage you to look up the lyrics yourself. But, uh, and Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. What's he saying there? Hurry up and get here. Yeah. <laughs> I have to get here. I know you're coming. I'd ri really like to see it. Uh, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. What's he describing? Jesus' second coming. Yeah, second coming. Thessalonians. Thessalonians, yeah. Thessalonians? First Thessalonians 4 and 5. Uh, Revelation 19. Second coming of Christ. Uh, and I like this, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. He knows that when, when Christ comes, it's not going to be pretty. 
Right? You read Revelation 19, he's coming back with an army, and he's making war. Even so, it is well with my soul. Even in the midst of that, you're righteous, you're holy. Well, and I, I think even you. so, it's like, until that day, haste the day, and mm. we'll, unless that day comes, or until that day comes, it's still good. I'm still good because of what you've done. Yeah. Even if I don't see it. Right. Yeah. All right, so we understand the lyrics. Good. I typed up this. Most of this comes from the Library of Congress uh, website. Uh, I've added a few pieces here and there where I have other information. But you just kind of read it. Feel free to read along. In 1871, Horatio Spafford, a prosperous lawyer and devout Presbyterian church elder, and his wife, Anna, were living comfortably with their four young daughters in Chicago. In that year, the Great Fire broke out and devastated the entire city. Uh, Horatio G. Spafford lost basically all of his property. He was, again, wealthy landowning, property owning lawyer, and he lost all of the fire. Uh, two years later, the family decided to vacation with friends in Europe. At the last moment, Horatio was detained by business, and Anna and the girls went on ahead, sailing on the ocean liner SS Ville de Havre. I don't know how to pronounce that. On September 21st, 1873, the liner was rammed amidship by a British vessel and sank within minutes. Anna was picked up unconscious on a floating spar, but the four children had drowned. Nine days after the shipwreck, Anna landed in Cardiff, Wales, and cabled Horatio, Saved alone, what shall I do? After receiving Anna's telegram, Horatio immediately left Chicago to bring his wife home. On the Atlantic crossing, the captain of his ship called Horatio to his cabin to tell him that they were passing over the spot where his four daughters had perished. He wrote to Rachel, his wife's half-sister, On Thursday last we passed over the spot where she, where she went down, in mid-ocean, the waters three miles deep. But I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe, folded in, folded the dear lambs. Horatio wrote this hymn, It Is Well, as he passed over the watery grave. So that's the story of how the hymn was written. Uh, a little more background before we keep reading on. Uh, Horatio Spafford was a friend of Philip Bliss, another well-known hymn writer. We'll eventually do a couple of Bliss's hymns that he wrote the lyrics to also. But Philip Bliss wrote the, the music for It Is Well. Uh, so Horatio wrote the lyrics, and then uh, Bliss wrote the music to match it up. Mm -hmm. Last week we talked about how hymns were often just put to some random tune that people knew. This one, the tune was specifically written for the hymn. So this is one of those ones where I would say, well, no, the tune needs to be preserved along with the lyrics because it was written specifically in accompaniment with one another uh, as opposed to separately. There's more to the story of Horatio G. Spafford, though. Uh, just like last week when we talked about uh, Come Thou Fount with Robert Robinson, uh, talked about the controversy that surrounded his later turn towards possibly Unitarianism. Uh, Unitarianism means believing that there's one God and only one God and not three persons, so denying the, the Trinity. It's Unitarianism. Horatio uh, G. Spafford has some controversy surrounding his later life. Uh, so, picking up in the third paragraph there. The Spaffords did their best to put together their shattered lives back in Chicago. In 1878, a daughter, Bertha, was born, and two years later, a son, Horatio. After an epidemic of scarlet fever broke out, and their baby son died, it seemed that the Spaffords were doomed to unhappiness. Rumors, rumors ran rampant through their church. What had the Spaffords done that God could visit such misfortunes upon them? Horatio left the Fullerton Presbyterian Church, which he had helped to build. In solidarity, a group of Spafford's friends also abandoned the ch Chicago church and together decided to seek solace in God's guidance <coughs> together. Uh, their messianic sect was dubbed the Overcomers by American Press. So this is an interesting point. Uh, so just as a question to, to ponder, I think there's a pretty clear answer. What was it that caused Spafford and his wife to leave the church? I'm not sure. What do you mean it's clear? The rumors? Yeah, the rumors. And what were the rumors? What have they done? Yeah, what had they done yeah, to, deserve to deserve all of this punishment by God? Right. Okay. Bad theology. I was going to say, couldn't they read that in the Gospels? <laughs> yeah. Terrible theology. The idea that 
that bad things happen to you because you're a bad person or because oh. you have some specific sin because that you're being punished for. Uh, this is a perfect example of bad theology leads to bad practice, and it causes problems later on. So yeah, uh, the Spaffords also, it's reported Horatio G. Spafford was massively depressed after the death of his son and never fully recovered. Uh, was a clinically depressed man. Uh, and largely because of the the bad theology and resultant condemnation of his fellow church members at the full-time Presbyterian Church. And so they withdrew from proper church community. I'll put it that way and we'll keep reading. Uh, the sect, their messianic sect was dubbed the Overcomers by American Press. Their group soon decided to travel to and live in the holy city of Jerusalem. Delaying only until the birth of their daughter Grace in 1881, the Spaffords set out for Jerusalem with a band of 13 adults and three children. The 13 of them were centered around the Spaffords, and they went to live sort of a monastery kind of life. In a rented house in the old city, the group quickly adapted to their new surroundings because they had no interest in proselytizing. They were warmly received by a local community, among whom they began philanthropic work. Called the American Colony by their neighbors, they sought to live a communal life on the, mode, on the model of the early Christian church. Horatio continued to search the Bible, Bible for guidance and for signs of the end time when Jesus Christ would reappear in Jerusalem, although the colony was criticized and harassed by several of the American consuls in Jerusalem for their seemingly unorthodox religious life. The colony survived and thrived as a religious community. Again, this is that part straight from the Library of Congress. Uh, I think some of the criticism of their unorthodox life was justified. Some of the things that came out of the American colony were very good. Some of the things that came out of the American colony were kind of strange and uh, unorthodox in a technical sense, uh, as in not orthodox Christianity. Uh, Final paragraph, Horatio died of malaria in Jerusalem on October 16, 1888. By the end of his life, he taught and practiced many strange and unorthodox theologies, to name a few. He believed in the eventual salvation of all, including Satan. And he believed that his American colony was playing a part in fulfilling the end times roles. Some reports even say that he believed himself and his colony to be the second coming of the Messiah. In his depression and delusion from the malaria near the end of his life, claimed to be the second coming. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was sort of where it all went. And it, you kind of trace it back to a single point of, of bad theology in his home, church, home Presbyterian church, where he was being ostracized and condemned by the church community because they believed bad things don't happen to good people, so you must have done something wrong. I feel like like I'm, I'm essentially, so far, we've just gone through and said, okay, let's ruin your favorite hymns. Uh, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but, uh, part of what, what I, I, I'm hoping you get out of the, the hymn things that we're doing, looking at hymns, is realizing that the people who wrote hymns were people. Uh, and words are true if they're true regardless of who or how they write them. Uh, and in particular, if the intent behind the words at the time of writing was true, it remains true regardless of what that person does later. Isn't it Philippians, I think it's Philippians, that says it doesn't matter, like some people, because I'm in prison, they think they can take advantage of this and they're preaching the gospel, yeah. but it doesn't matter what the, the motive is the gospel as long is being as the gospel preached. is preached. Yeah. So it's the same kind of idea with this. Yeah. Uh, sort of the silver lining within it all. But uh, absolutely no detraction on the truth of the hymn and the amazing comfort and power it's had over the centuries. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous hymn. It's very well written. And it contains the truth that Christ is coming. And so rest in that assurance. Oh. Okay. To our lesson. Where is my manila hunter? Anyone else? Sorry. No. Okay. okay, so we're going to finish up our lesson from two weeks ago, which should take about half the time, two thirds of the time. And then we're going to start into 
what would be this week's and next week's lesson of the biblical defense of, of the, the, the Trinity. Uh, this was a review from past lessons that we've done in home group, and then also sort of an emphasis on history, as opposed to uh, biblical, because we're going to have a whole extra lesson on, on the biblical stuff. But to review what we did last time, really quickly, we went through history and heresies, and we were just getting to the creeds portion. Uh, so some of the history that we went through, remember I, I gave you that, that uh, what's the marker, rule of thumb to go by, of when you're thinking about history and to try to keep things in perspective, how long has America existed? About 240 years. And so use that, think about all the history that's happened in America from powdered wigs and writing with quill pens to today where we all have computers in our pockets. Uh, multiple wars, the Civil War and the Vietnam War, World War I and II, all of this stuff that's happened in American history in 240 years. Uh, use that as sort of your guide, how, how, how to view history when you're studying it. Uh, realize, so these, his, these heresies that we went through, Arius was like the first one we talked about him, and realize what, Eutychus is 120 years later. So it's like half of the time that America has existed is, is the distance of time between Arius and Eutyches. So my, my point is don't recognize that these things are developing and happening over a period of time. It's not like, okay, Arius is done, and then the next day we wake up and Eutyches is here, and he's promoting another heresy. It's like it, it takes time to, to come about. Uh, so we talked about the four major church heresies that cropped up during the early church, 300, or 32 to, to 4 or 500. Uh, Arius, Arianism was the first one. Anybody remember what Arianism is? Kind of says it right there. So what Arius, the Jesus was created being by, like, but not seen as a Yeah, that's amazing. Great job, man. <laughs> well. Ari Arianism says Jesus was not fully God. He did not have full deity. He is not existent from the from pre pre existent pre existing time like uh, God the Father is. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, is Arius' big thing. Uh, quote in Colossians, right? Uh, that text, firstborn of all creation. That means he can't be God himself. He's like the first created being. He's not an uncreated, self existent being the way that God truly is. And so this was this was Arius, this is the heresy of Arianism. Remember, I told you he spread his views a lot through music, through songs. People would walk around town singing songs that Arius had written that taught the Arian heresy, and so it became really, really popular. And it was the biggest problem in the church for about 300 years, easily. It was Arianism. Uh, Apollinarius came up and it, again trying to fight Arius a little bit and trying to figure out how does Jesus work, God and man, and, and one, that he would say Jesus isn't fully human. He was just fully God. Like, yeah, I know he can sympathize with us in every way because Hebrews says that, but like he wasn't, he wasn't like completely human. He didn't have a, a human essence at all. Uh, he was just God. Uh, Nestorius came along a little bit after him, said Jesus had two warring natures and the divine overpowered the human. So it's like you got God and, and man sort of duking it out, and then at the baptism was when God sort of won out over man. Uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, right? Uh, and Eutyches came along and said he wasn't fully God or fully man, he was 50-50. So he was a completely different thing. He, he was not completely God. He was not completely man. He was two halves to make one whole. It's all of this trying to reconcile, most of these are trying to reconcile how Jesus could be both God and man, obviously. Yeah. I have a question. Okay, so for you, because you have that modern equivalent Mormons, are, is there anyone who like has like, some of these other yeah, like, uh, Arianism or... Jehovah's Witnesses are, are, are essentially Arians. Okay. Uh, they, so they'll look at that... Um, it, it, it's not, it doesn't line up exactly right, but... Yeah, but yeah. Ari Arianism most commonly today would be Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. Uh, Jesus is a God, not the God. Right. And he was created. Yeah. Yeah. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. Yeah. yeah. 
They don't understand the unauthorized pre-verbal predicate nominative. But you guys do, because you took Greek. Jonathan does. Yeah. They say that? Let me try it. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus was, was a God, not the God. Jesus is lesser than, than God himself. Basically, Arianism. So these are all things that were going on in the early church. And you recognize the span of years. And uh, it took a long time. And remember, the other thing, what happened in 312 that, that sort of brought these heresies out of life. Anyone? Oh, Council of Christianity was legal. Christianity was, yeah, was, was made legal. Yes, correct. Edict of Milan, 312. Council of Nicaea was 325. The Council of Nicaea was in response to Arianism, mainly. Uh, what's it? Constantine becomes emperor. He makes Christianity legal with the Edict of Milan. He says, uh, you know, all of these Christians are arguing, and Aaron, this guy Arius says that Jesus wasn't this guy, and these other guys are saying something else, so everybody go into a room and figure it out. Come out and give me a verdict. And so that produced the Nicene Creed, which you guys have, I think. I gave you guys the Nicene Creed. Uh, we talked about the different segments of that history, so 100 to 150, and then we, we kind of marched through and talked about what were they fighting the most in each of these different periods. Was there ever any research to indicate how they reached those heresies? Like, Yeah, you can read some of the, well, obviously the, oh, how, how, the, how the heretics came up with their heresies? Yeah. Uh, usually, it was it was people honestly trying to figure this out, Try, just trying their best, reading the text, and trying to figure out how do we deal with Jesus as God and Jesus as man. And so they try to come up with answers that would make sense. Uh, and so this, the thing that again I, I tried to press last week was. Uh, I said last week, two weeks ago, was that these these weren't it was it, it it wasn't a question until these questions were asked, right? The apostles are teaching Jesus is the Christ and Jesus is God, and everybody's like, oh yeah, of course, and Jesus was a man, obviously, because he was walking among us, right? Yeah, of course, he was a man, but they didn't sit down and say, okay, well now let's work out the, the ins and outs of how exactly he was both God and man, because that seems like a logical contradiction. They're just like, somebody asked you, was Jesus, was Jesus God? Well, yeah, of course. Was Jesus a man? Yeah, of course. And we move on with our lives. Uh, it wasn't until somebody came along and said, well, wait a minute, I don't like that, that doesn't make sense, you have to explain it, uh, that they started nailing down the, okay, well, here's exactly how we'll articulate this truth. And so that's what the creeds were. The creeds were, everyone had this, or the vast majority of people had this understanding of the, the true doctrines of the church, but they hadn't articulated them. They hadn't put them into to definite words. And so when come, somebody comes along and says, all right, well, let's try to put words onto it, and they come up with the wrong words, like Arius, the, the church says, well, no, that can't be right because of this. And they, then they would say, well, will you recant? Will you agree that that's wrong because of this? If they say, yeah, you're right, you have better words, we'll, we'll fix it, then great, we have church unity, we move on with our merry lives. The reason these guys became famous is because they, they get confronted with that. We don't like those words. You're not picking the right words to describe this truth. And the heretic says, well, no, my words are right. I, I have it right, you guys have it wrong. And then the majority of the church gets together and says, well, we're going to officially condemn you as a heretic. This is a heresy. That's how heretics and heresies come about. So it wasn't that we shouldn't demonize them for coming up with these heresies, but the Sticking fact to that them. they, yeah, the yeah, that they still argued when they, yeah, okay, right, when they were presented with with here's why you're wrong, and the majority of the church and the 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 church leaders, and I would say guided by the, the Holy Spirit in the church councils and producing the creeds, mm -hmm. uh, and they still said no, I'm right, you're wrong. That's when they become a heretic. You can be very careful whether you use the word heretic. It's someone who valid, who knows the truth and specifically denies it. But it didn't normally start as like intentional heresy. No, very just trying to find. Very rarely, I think any of these started out as <coughs> with evil intention, intentions. I think a couple of these you can look at, uh, like Montanus came along and said, "I'm I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm the Comforter that that Christ promised," and then he spoke in t tongues to validate it. I think he was coming along trying to make a power grab, and so. That would, would be one, that, a heres, heresy that 
started out with fairly evil intent. He was trying to enforce himself on other people. But generally speaking, it was Christians who were trying to figure stuff out. And then down the road, we figured out that they were heretics. Did they try to make it political? Quite often, yes. Yeah, the, the bishop system throughout the three, four, five hundreds, and really on into up to the, the Reformation almost, was, was very political. Whoever was bishop of a city had a, a target on his head and had a lot of sway. Uh, because power corrupts and ultimate power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, they weren't really taught the word of God. They were taught through the church, right? And they weren't encouraged to directly read the word of God. Definitely later, once you hit about about seven eight hundred, right. with the the real ultimate collapse of Rome into the Dark Ages, that's when when you're just taught wrote uh, exactly. and so it's not really taught how to how to read the scriptures for yourself. Oh, right. during this time though, one hundred. So I'm not going to go through all of this because you can watch the video if you missed it or refresh. But during all this time, everyone's still reading the scriptures for themselves. Uh, when until you get to the theologians, Latin starts becoming the, the lingua franca, the, the main language that everyone speaks. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they stop reading the, the scriptures in the original languages. But it's also during this time that they develop the language, that they produce the creeds. Most of the creeds were, were produced between 300 and 600. And so we got through there. We finished off talking about Athanasius. Uh, and we read the Athanasius Creed, which you have in the back part of that staple book. Yeah. Where does the Gutenberg Bible fall into this timeline? That's like 1400s, so 1600s, okay. yeah, post Reformation. Okay. Or around the time of the Reformation. Right, okay. This is where we, we stop. So these were the, the councils and creeds that they got together and produced during this time. So you had Nicaea first, 325, and that was all about Arianism. That was, this guy is saying that Jesus is not fully God. How are we going to combat him? What is the right answer? And so that's where you get the uh, Nicene Constantinople Creed, which is the second to last page on here. So this is Creed's appendix. So the First Council of Nicaea 325, they produced this creed, which was based off of the Apostles' Creed, which you guys know from the song by Rich Mullins, uh, or by the, the newer one. So Rich Mullins is, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven, Maker of Earth. Uh, there's a newer one. Yeah, so I believe in God the Father. Yeah. I believe in God the Father, I believe in Christ the Son. Wait. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, no, they're both based off of the Apostles' Creed. Oh, Their lyrics are, are essentially the same. I yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, the First Council of Nicaea, they officially condemn Arianism. They bring Arius and say, so this is the, the creed that we're going by, and you're wrong. Jesus was not a created being. He is coexistent, co-eternal with God the Father. Uh, will you recant? He says no. Uh, but they produce the creed, and then as far as the church as an official institution is concerned, the matter is dealt with. As far as the culture is concerned, it's not. Arianism soldiers on. It continues, it really, Arianism continues on until about the 800s is when it pilfers out, uh, as far as a strong opponent in the church. But it, it hung around for a long time. And it was hung around strongly enough right after the Council of Nicaea but they got back together at Constantinople and said, uh, Arianism's still a thing. We need to adjust our creed to, to make sure that we really condemn every single point that he's talking about that is wrong. So if you look in here, these are very close to the same creed. The first Council of Nicaea, 325, is the first one that they produced in 325. And then Council of Constantinople is what, about 75 years later? And, was that math right? 55 years later. And, uh, that's kind of, it's got the adjustment. So if you read the, the top explanation, comparison between Creed of 325 and Creed of 328, or 381, the following table juxtaposes the earlier and the later forms of this Creed in the English translation given in Schott's work. 
which indicates by square brackets the portions of the 325 text that were omitted or moved in 381. So that's like down here at the end. But those who say there was a time when he was not, and he was not before he was made, and he was made out of nothing, and he is of another substance or essence, or the Son of God is created or changeable or alterable, they are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. That was their kind of addendum to the Creed in 325 to say, Arius, you're out. Right? Those are all things that Arius was saying. They're saying there was a time when he was not. And they're saying, no, Jesus is eternal in, in eternity past. Uh, he has always been. That's what John 1 1 says, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, and those who say he was made out of nothing, uh, no, he wasn't the first creation. He was begotten, not made. We talked about that difference last week. And so they have that phrase in here, the only begotten, but they, uh, they change it a little bit and uh, clarify it in the later creed. Uh, so... Uh, you can read those and, and compare for yourself. They also clarify a lot of the human part of him. Uh, I say part. That's not really proper language to talk about Jesus, but <laughs> the human nature of Christ. Uh, but he was crucified under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. And on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into the heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come with glory to judge the living and the dead. They're adding in these sorts of things to, to let you know he was a literal human being who walked on the earth and died in a physical sense. Pontius Pilate crucified him, that sort of stuff. So you can compare those on your own time. Uh, Constantinople is also when Apollinarius comes, comes along, so the idea that he wasn't fully man, just fully God, uh, that's why they're adding in those phrases in 381 to combat Apollinarianism. <clears throat> it's kind of funny because Arianism and Apollinarianism are like exact opposites. One yeah. says all God, the other one says all man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. I mean. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, and it's Apollinarian, Apollinarius is coming along and he's trying to combat Arianism, but he goes too far. He overcorrects. So the these are this what this the seven Catholic councils is how some people will say it the these, these are the councils that almost all Protestants and Roman Catholics agree on. They don't have any contention over the decisions of these councils. It's not quite as clear-cut as these were the seven major ones, and they knew that these were going to be the seven uh, official councils when they, when they were having them. Uh, that's sort of how it gets taught a lot, but it's not quite that way. These were people were getting together. It's not like every single person in the church or every major bishop was there, but a lot of them were. The majority of them were there at these seven. They had other councils interspersed in between here where other decisions were made that are not as widely recognized today. It's these seven are the ones that most everyone agrees with, except for the uh, Eastern Orthodox, which would dispute the seventh, Nicaea too. They don't like uh, the iconoclasm, the idea that we need to tear down icons, and uh, they, they're very much into icons. Uh, I think that's a good little chart that summarizes it. I did not make that. I stole it from one of my professors. Nice little summary of the seven major church councils. Uh, last thing is, so what did they come, what conclusions did they come to? First of all, you got the creeds. How do you know what conclusions they came to? They came to the creeds. You can also read, uh, they, they recorded a lot of what happened in the councils. If you have the time and you are interested, you can read a whole lot about what was happening in the, the councils for free. On uh, if, you, if you just Google Apostolic Fathers, I went through and downloaded them all. I think it's EECL, ECCL. Oh, you told us about that on their call. Yeah. C C E L. That's it. C C E L. Yeah. Christian Classic Classics Ethereal Library. 
Uh, you can go and browse serial authors. These are lots of different authors, but also you can read the Church Fathers right there. And these are like all of the writings. Anti-Nicene Fathers, meaning anti, meaning prior. So before Nicene, these were the Church Fathers who were writing things against different heretics. Uh, and so it's split up a lot, similar to the, the history that I split it up for you here, first, first century, second century, third century. Post-Nicene Fathers, so Augustine is the very big one for post-Nicene, Chrysostom is another. Uh, Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers, here's kind of the lesser post-Nicene Fathers. Uh, but the seven ecumenical councils, you see that last one? Volume 15. Or 16? So the seven ecumenical councils is the one that uh, talks a lot about what they were doing at these seven councils and details a lot of their writings and the arguments that they were having. So it's a whole volume. If you read it in print, it's like that thick. So you can go get all the info you want on these guys if you so choose. Uh, but we'll get back to this. What else, what were the, to boil down, what did they come up with? What are the, the key points of their Trinitarian theology that by 600 AD, if you don't believe this about God, you're not a Christian, is what they were saying? A few key points. First of all, <clears throat> conclusion one, there's three qualities that you have to affirm about God. The three qualities are unity, diversity, and equality. So, unity, meaning... There is one God. And the language that they came up with is essence. We're going to talk about that in a second. But this one. Unity being that there is one God. One true being that is self-existent, eternal, creator of the universe, sustainer of all life, God. There is one of those. There's not multiple of them. Another thing that they came up with is diversity. There is a diversity of uh, persons within this one unity, this one essence, God. The persons are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So those are two of the qualities, unity, diversity, and finally equality. All three of these persons within this essence of God are equal in authority and power. Right? The Father isn't like higher or better than the sun. The sun isn't higher or better than the spirit. Uh, they are equal in terms of their authority and power. But so they're distinct. Throws, the... Sorry, what? I was going to say that throws me because I always put the father on at the top. The top. Yeah. yeah. And we, we usually number them the first person of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity. That's right. just to differentiate them. Right not to say that the first is higher or better than the second, or that the second is higher or better than the third. And so this is a nice little graphic, again, not my original work, uh, but uh, sort of the heresy that comes from denying that quality. So three qualities to affirm unity, diversity, equality, and then the three heresies to deny that sort of come out of this, if you, if you deny the unity, you end up with tritheism. If you're saying that there's more than one God, saying that there's multiple gods, you're, you're going to end up a tritheist. You're going to say that there's three diff distinct gods. And that is inaccurate. That is a wrong way to talk about it. <coughs> there are not three gods. There is one god. There are three persons. We're going to talk about God, essence and persons in a second. Uh, equality. If you deny equality, you end up with subordinationism. Where one of the two persons is subordinate, or less than, the other two person, the other person, right? Uh, you you end up making one of them weaker, or not quite as godly as the other two. And if you deny the diversity, that that there are three distinct persons, you end up with modalism, one god and three persons. But we're going to say those three persons are are three manifestations of the same essence, God, 
that show up at different times, right? So remember the modalism, the the analogy for modalism that I showed you that so many people use that is kind of a bad one is the ice water and and water vapor. Uh, modalism is a heresy. It says that there's only one person essentially, uh, and that this one person shows up in three different forms, and that's wrong. When when God when Jesus exists, the Father also exists. There is a distinction there that is existent from the beginning of eternity. Uh, it's not like when, when God the Father, it's not like God the Father became God the Son and then became God the Spirit. They are all three eternally existent. Uh, so that would be the problem when you start denying diversity, when you start denying the distinction of persons, you end up with modalism. So I think this is a good graphic to sort of let you know how to, you want to stay inside the circle, right? You, you, want to, you want to affirm these three qualities without affirming their opposites, their heresies. So um, on the subordinationism. Yeah. Um, so Jesus was clearly subordinate to the Father in, in obedience. So, yeah. Jesus so, clearly submits to the Father, right. but he is not subordinate. And so again, that's so it's a it's a it's a, a, uh, a willful act of leaving his position. But and I wouldn't need to say that. Well, well, I mean that he 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 acted according to the Father's wishes. Correct. Yeah. Very well. Yeah. Right. Which you argue is of their will together, but no, I would say they have distinct wills. So um, part of their distinct persons. Okay. Yeah. So, but then, so Jesus was pretty clear because of his, the way he talked and the way he acted. So, but the Holy Spirit is a little bit different in that um, you could say that. God sent Jesus mm -hmm. initially, and then Jesus essentially sent the Holy Spirit, right? Um, yeah. But there's a, I guess you're, you're right, I guess I'm, I'm processing the word you use of submit. Yeah, so they, I, they, I would they, use this, the word be, submit, yeah, not the word subordinate. So subordinate being a very technical term is right. a suborder, right. right, right, a, a right, lesser right. class, right. which would be wrong. Yeah. Okay. You had a hand up? Yeah. Uh, how does a modalist respond when confronted with passages where Jesus is speaking with the Father? Uh, it, it's, it's figures of speech. It's, it's, uh, the, because if you're, spe if, if you're speaking to the Father, you're also speaking to Jesus. And it, they sort of gloss over it. So they really don't have an argument for it? No. Uh, this is another sort of conclusion number two. So the, t the two main conclusions that by the year 600 we've come out with. One is these three qualities to affirm and three heresies to deny. The other is the right language to talk about the, the Trinity. And the right language is three essences, excuse me, <laughs> scratch that, three persons, <laughs> one essence. <laughs> So the exact opposite. Yeah. Three essences is wrong. Do you know with three essences? One essence, three persons. So the three persons are the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The one essence is God. Uh, the, for, you know? Stephen. Well, you can draw it real quick if you want. Son, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you can put these in any bubbles you want. Right. You don't have to have Father up at the apex of the triangle. Uh, but the, the point is, the Son is not the Father. He is distinct from the Father. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. He's distinct from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. He's distinct from the Father. Uh, but the Son is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The point is, they share one essence or one substance. Substance would be another 
legitimate word for that. But they're distinct persons. And again, the language is very specific. Like I said, they, they spent hundreds of years figuring out how are we going to talk about this thing that's really hard to talk about. Because we as finite human beings cannot fully comprehend what it means to be both three and one. It just does not compute. One plus one plus one is three, not one. Right? Unless you're God. Unless you're God. Uh, then you get to do those things. Since you made the rules of reality, you can bend them. Uh, I don't know if I would put it that way. But, uh, but yeah, that God is this being, one essence, three persons. So it's, if anything that you that you walk away from this whole study of the Trinity that's going to be what, four or five weeks long, at least, uh, remember that. The way you talk about the Trinity, one essence, three persons. Uh, that said, what we're going to do here on a little bit further, we're going to turn to looking at the biblical defense. So we talked about the history. We talked about the language that they came up, the theology that they did. Right? We talked about, remember way back, we talked about how we do theology. Uh, you observe all of the evidence and then you systematize. And so that's what they did. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the text, the place that you should start, and say, did they systematize correctly? How do, how do we account for all of these things that we see in the text describing the persons and essences or essence of God? Uh, what, would we come up with the same conclusions? Were they right? And I would say that they were right. Uh, I'm going to go in with that presupposition. Uh, but trying to divorce yourself from that for a little while while, you, while you're studying the text and over the next couple weeks and see if, if their conclusions were correct based on the Bible. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the three persons individually. Today we should only, we probably only get through the Father. In fact, I only prepared up through the Father, so we'll, we'll break after the Father. And then we will look at the Son and the Spirit next week, the, the biblical definitions. And then we will look at the biblical places where we can defend Trinity showing up and look at some problem passages. So what about this place where it says God is uh, one? Or what about this passage where it says there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus? Well, wait a second. It sounds like he's saying Jesus is just man. Uh, we'll talk through some of those things and how do we deal with them. That's a look ahead. So, turning to what today's lesson, put quotes around that since this was all today's lesson, but the handout for the Father is right here, uh, which I don't know if you guys have yet. But I'm going to get over to that PowerPoint. Can do it. Just connect. Wait, no. You're right. One of the other. See, see what you made me do. Oh, how did I even say that? I don't like that song. See what was good in her, in her golden years. One of the other problems you're going to run into as we start doing this is that you might get a little bit bored because it's a lot of words. It's just, that's just the way you, you kind of have to do it. It's, it's hard to put pictures on things that are incomprehensible. You can put words on them easier than you can put pictures on them. Uh, and once you start trying to put pictures to this thing that is not represented in reality except for himself, the Trinity, uh, you get into dicey water. Like when you start trying to say that God is like water. It doesn't, it doesn't work out well for you. So we shy away from images and analogies when we start talking about Trinitarian theology because when you, when you start doing that, you, you start getting it wrong. So we stick with the words more often than with the pictures. Uh, so that's part of why it can get boring. So the, the way you combat that is stay really engaged in the the idea that we're talking about. We're talking about the creator of the universe, and we're trying to get to know what he is like better, and how we can talk about him better, and how we can commune with him better. And so, uh, 
knowing how he shows up in this book and what the right way to talk about him is will help us in our walk. But I do have to admit, it does have the potential to get boring. So you just kind of have to guard yourself against that and stay focused. Uh, that said, the outline for the, the sort of the, the next couple weeks is, first of all, on the Father. We're going to talk about the first person of the Trinity, the Father. Uh, and also we're going to talk about words for God and passages ascribing deity to God the Father. And we're going to do the same thing for the Son, and then also look at some problem passages for the Son. And then we're going to look at the Spirit. And then we're going to look at the Trinity as a whole. And hopefully, you'll, you'll come out learning something. <laughs> so starting with on the Father. First of all, the Father is uh, not called the Father until the New Testament. Okay? First place he's called the Father is... Uh, and I think that's later on, on the PowerPoint. But the first place he's called the Father is in Matthew, when Jesus starts talking about it as the Father. He's, he comes up and he says, uh, He is the Father and I am his Son. I am the Son of God. And by the way, you all are sons of God if you believe in me. This is new language. We haven't talked about God in this way yet. Father is, is new. The words for God prior to that, that the Jews were used to in reading in the Old Testament, and what the average Greek speaker was used to were these. So, uh, Yahweh, Lord. That's, and what's in quotes is how it's going to show up in your Bible, usually, in your English translation. Lord with all caps. That's, when, whenever you see Lord with all caps in your Bible, that means Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is the covenant name of God. It's the one revealed to him. You revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai, the, the most important, probably, name of God. This is the one that, when the scribes would copy it, they had a ritual that they had to wash their hands before and after writing the word because it was so holy. It's the one that they would not write the vowels in because they did not want to profane it or, or run the risk of prof profaning it, right? You shall uh, the, do not say the name, name of your Lord God in vain. And this was a very important commandment. And so to, to avoid that risk of, of saying his name in vain in any way, they're going to alter it so that they never say it. Which, again, is just coming up with bad ways of doing the right thing. <laughs> you want to keep the name of God holy, so the way you're going to do that is never say it. Uh, don't maybe see a problem with that, but I digress. Uh, it's Yahweh is a conjugation of the verb to be. So in English, right, we would say to be, what's the first person form of the, the verb to be, first person singular, I am, yeah. Plural would be we are, right? He is, that's, that's the verb, is, in Hebrew. It's a conjugation of it, Yahweh. And that is the actual verb, Ahaya, which is I am. So when he's saying to Moses, I, I am that I am, tell them I am is sent you, he's actually saying Ahaya. He's not saying Yahweh. The, the text there is actually not the, the same spelling. How do you say that? I-I-E-H-A-Y-E? Eh, hi-yeah. Oh, L-E-H, okay. Yeah. Uh, Elohim, another very common word for God. That's the first one used for God. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So that's the very first word for God that we see in the Bible. Uh, usually translated Lord or God. If you see the, the phrase, the Lord God, usually it's Yahweh Elohim. So they're using both of those words right next to each other to make clear. We're not just talking about any Elohim, any God, like your, God, like your Elohim Baal. He's not, a real, he's not a real God. He's not a real Elohim. We're talking about Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, the true God, the one who is. Uh, Adonai, generic Hebrew word that usually means master, like, like you would say master-slave sort of relationship, uh, often used of the Lord God, Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, Master, God. It'll be translated both of those ways in your, in your text. And side, side note, Hebrew, so, <laughs> how much time we got? Yeah, okay. Hebrew, <laughs> Hebrew, uh, Hebrew doesn't have vowels in it originally in the text, right? We ha the original texts that we have, the oldest that we have, are called unpointed texts. It means you have the consonants, you don't have any vowels. 
Hebrew doesn't have vowels in its, in its normal system. The vowels were added later because it was a pronounced language. It wasn't really a written language. So uh, they took the vowels from the word Adonai and they put them into the letters, the consonants, Y-H-W-H, or yod heh vav -Hey, Yahweh, as a way of when we're reading the text out loud in synagogue, we, we need something to say here. Uh, so they would they put in the, the vowels of this word to the, to the consonants of that word, and that's where you get the word Yahweh. Uh, the A, A, comes from Adonai. Uh, and without knowing Hebrew, it's harder to explain that, so take my word for it at, at that point. But the, the again, this is, this is a, a, a this is, they're, they're trying to keep the name pure, and they're just doing it the wrong way. So I, I find so kind of funny, but also relatable. We do that so much. We put up these, these barriers, make up these rules to, to better worship God, to better keep his commands, and they end up getting in, in the way for us ourselves. And we start putting emphasis on the rules that we make up, not the rules that God made up. And uh, keeping those clear is, is a good practice. Always checking yourself and saying, is this a rule that God actually gave, or is this a rule that I made up to help me keep a rule that God gave? Which one are you enforcing on yourself and which one are you enforcing on other people? And is it getting in the way of your worship of God? And if so, ditch it. Uh, I think that that's an example of what happened with this word, Yahweh. He said, remember this name, don't, don't, don't use it in vain. And they said, all right, we're going to keep it real separate. And they ended up just messing it. Yeah. <laughs> they ended up separating themselves from God along with separating themselves from the word. Uh, El is another really short, it's shortened form of Elohim. Elohim is actually the plural of El. Uh, but Elohim is always used as a singular, even though it's a plural form. It'd be like if we said sheeps, but we meant singular sheep. Like octopus. Yeah. Sort of. Like octopi would be. Oh, um, well, I meant, uh, like Moose. Yeah, so that's moose. L is also a common prefix and suffix. So, for example, Israel. Right? L, and Israel means uh, to contend with. L, contend with God. When Jacob's name was changed to Israel, it means because he fought with God. Uh, Bethel, when Jacob has the dream and he, and he sets up this monument, he calls the place Bethel. Bethel, Beth means house. L means God, house of God. Uh, so, anytime you see that L ending, it's, it's a, an homage to God, Elohim. Same with Yah. Anytime you see the Yah ending, or Ah ending, that's an homage to the, the name Yahweh. Uh, so, Azariah. Uh, it's Zachariah. Zachariah. It's, it's a, it's a, they're called theophoric names. Yeshua. 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 <laughs> uh, Daniel. Same thing. It's okay. If it comes up, just stop me. Okay. So anyway, these are these are all the Hebrew words for God. Notice none of them are Father. Oh, Bab yeah. El, Babel, is that? Bab El. I don't know what the Bab root is, but very likely. Uh, uh, in the New Testament. Your, your main words are kurias, which means Lord. Again, that's kind of the, kurias is the equivalent of Adonai. So this is the Greek, that's the Hebrew. Uh, master, Lord, Governor. Uh, and Theos, which is kind of your, your plain Jane word for God, much like Elohim. Those are really the only two words that, that get translated God in the New Testament. Then you have uh, Abba, in Hebrew, which means Father. Again, not used for God until Jesus comes along, and he's speaking Aramaic, and he's saying Abba. Uh, and the, what's the Greek for God? Pater, Father. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I realized that was that was probably boring for you, but I love the language aspect, so. <laughs> well, I like, I like, I want to learn about uh, so the those are those are the names for God. And the other thing that you'll that you'll see a lot is is 
combination of the word Elohim or Yahweh with a description. So God protector, God redeemer, God savior. Uh, Is that where like El Shaddai comes in? Right, El Shaddai, Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah yeah. is yeah, just was... Yahweh. Jehovah just means Yahweh. It's the Germans messing up the word Yahweh. So just so you know. So Rapha is what? Germans. <laughs> <laughs> Heals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it, that's, Rapha is healer in one language. Hebrew. 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 Yeah. How did the Germans get Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh? Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. Uh, so all that's here. Well, yeah, those are German. <laughs> Germans messing up Hebrew. So they, they get the word Yahweh. Yahovah. Germans don't have Y's. So all of the Y's become J's. Oh, yeah. I noticed that. Yahovah. Like Jacob is Yahweh. Uh, so they. they, they, they their Y's become J's, Jehovah, and the W becomes a V. Because that's how you pronounce the German words. And, and so the, the phrases uh, So that's the, the English pronunciation of the German transliteration of the Hebrew word Yahweh. Yeah. <laughs> with, the letter, with the vowels from Adonai added in. That's how you get the word Jehovah. <laughs> uh, anyway. So the, the, phrases, the phrases translate into like... Other like, because I know, because I've heard like for like maybe like a song or something, and like it says all these phrases, and then it's like uh, I remember it says one of the phrases, and then it says like strong tower, and I'm like, so is the phrase that it said before that equivalent to strong tower, or is it is that not is that just one of? I don't. I mean, I have to hear the lyrics that you're talking about to yeah, say for sure, but uh, but probably would be my would be said, my guess. Uh, Rafa's healer, right? Yeah, Rafa. Means to heal on the phone. Uh, so these, these are, this is the, the point of this was, this is how they used to talk about God. They had these, this set of words that based on context you know you're talking about, uh, almost always you're talking about Yahweh, the Lord. And in particular, Deuteronomy 6.4, also known as the Shema, that's the first word in it, uh, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, hear. Uh, hear Israel. The, the, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, was like the clarion cry of Israel for hundreds and hundreds of years because of that verse, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Echad, one. And so Jesus comes along and starts saying, uh, he's my father, and then he's also pretty clearly claiming to be deity himself. And then the Christians come along and they're saying that there's three persons, and this does not gel with the clarion cry of Israel, which is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, this is why it took so long to get the doctrine of the Trinity nailed down, because we have to figure out how to talk about it. How is he one and also three? Because it says so clearly, he's one. Uh, one there, echad, means uh, also mean unity. He is a completeness, a singularity of essence. He is a unified force. That's how I would put it. But that's a little bit of a, a sidetrack. Every with me on the words that they used to talk about God. Let's, see. Let's look at a couple of passages. So the three main passages that ascribe deity to the Father, uh, or as they would call in the Old Testament, pretty much we, we sort of assume, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I think I put a slide in here for that. If not, remind me. Uh, Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, What's the word? That's John 1 1. You were close. Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, the Bible from the very first sentence presupposes God's existence. And he says, We know who we're talking about. We're talking about Elohim, Yahweh, God. He's the, oh, if you want to know something about him, he created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and as you start reading more, you learn more about this God, Elohim, Yahweh. The, the guy who created the heavens and the earth. What is he like? Uh, most of the time, we will... I don't know, keep trying to get to that, and I'll wait. Uh, so the, the existence of deity is presupposed in Scripture, and God creates and controls the world. This is something that we just sort of know from, from the get-go. This is who God is. Another big thing about this God, the one who exists, is that he has a covenant chosen people. Israel. He starts off with... With Adam and Eve, we, we get run down the line to Noah, and then all of a sudden we get to Abraham, and we are following Abraham and his kids for 
like 90% of this book. He cares about this family, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's name gets changed to Israel. Israel. Mm -hmm. Becomes the nation of Israel. This is his covenant chosen people. Uh, Exodus 3.14 is the one that we're going to dig in a little bit more to. So what's the context of Exodus 3? We've been through this before. Moses. Burning bush. Oh. Burning bush, yeah. Moses is out of the, uh, oh. out tending his sheep. He sees up on the, the hill a, fi a bush that is on fire but does not burn. He says, I will turn away to see this wondrous sight. Comes up, he says, he hears a voice coming from the bush that says, take off your shoes. I'm on, you're standing on holy ground. Uh, and then the voice tells him, go to the people of Israel or get them out of Egypt. And verse 13 Moses says to God, If I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent to me, sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, Ehaya, I am Ehaya. I am that I am. Uh, what's he claiming about himself? He is. He's got. He is. Yeah. He exists. He, he, his very name reveals the self-existence of God. He is. And in, also, he's claiming a personality to himself. He's using the first person singular, which, how do we, how do we deal with that as Trinitarians? Right? Who is talking here? Who is the I? And I am. Is it the Father? Is it the Son? Or is it the Holy Spirit? Or is it all three of them using the word I as a sort of you know, um, can it? Can means it? Can of expressing it? Denise? Um, in my version, it said the am is like Lord is for yeah. Yahweh. Yeah. It's all caps. Yeah, because so, uh, that's, that's where we get the word Yahweh. I'm going the wrong way this way. Oh, from Ihaye? Right? Yeah. Ihaye. Uh, it's, it's a conjugation of the word to be. Okay. So, that's, okay. you'll, yeah, you should see I am who I am is like a, you know, they'll render it as a proper name because it's, it's a, that's where we get Yahweh from, is from this interaction. This is when we learned to call God uh, to be verb, I am. Uh, well, and I kind of always have seen that as um, who was, who is, and who is to come. Yeah. I, I just am. Yeah. I've always been here, I always will be here, and I'm here right now. Exactly, yes. He's covering his self-existence. All of yeah. the tenses. All of the tenses. Like, you were saved, you will be saved, and you're being saved. Uh, That's tense. <laughs> that was but, the uh, worst part. Oh. <laughs> I thought that was there are other passages you can turn to to talk about this. The relationship between God and Israel. Uh, like there's like 20 chapters in Genesis that are devoted to this, right? Tracking Abraham through Isaac through Jacob, repeatedly promising, "I'm going to make a people of you. I'm going to give you this land." And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Spoiler, it's Jesus. That's how through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Uh, this is a key factor in God's personality, is his covenant relationship with Israel. If I bring it up. He is, a, even in this thing, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, I don't have it on there. we got time. We're... One second. Let me... Uh, go to Exodus 34. And if you're in a, if you're in like an electronic Bible, go to 33 because we're going to start right before 34. Okay, so what are we looking at? 33, verse 17. Book. Exodus. Exodus 36. 
So this is the same character, right, Moses, talking to the same character, God, a little bit later in the same book, Exodus. Uh, what else happened in between? Right? Chapter 3, he sends them to get the people of Israel from Egypt. What's happened in between? Give me a quick summary. Between when? Exodus 3 and Exodus 34. Um... Um, Moses, oh, so that, okay, so then Moses goes to the people. Moses goes, gets them, they have the whole plague situation, mm -hmm. uh, you have the angel of death, you have the institution of Passover, mm -hmm. uh, you have the Exodus, what the book's named for, right? leaving Egypt, crossing the Reed Sea, coming to Mount Sinai, uh, chapter 32, is the famous then, golden calf debacle. Oh, yeah. right? He comes up on the mountain, goes back down, comes back up, goes back down, comes back up, gets the law, and while he's doing that, they're down on on the base base camp having a party and creating their own god. Uh, and then me, breaks the tablets, comes back up onto the mountain, and God gives him a new set of tablets, and that's 33, 34. Uh, so, end of 33 is when God is getting all angry and Moses says, look, you've promised to take these people to, to the promised land, so you're going to have to keep your word, God. And God says, okay, you're right. Uh, because of who I am, I'm going to do that. Starting in verse 17. Uh, we'll start in verse 14, actually. So. Oh, yeah, Exodus chapter 33, verse 14. Oh, oh. God says to Moses, my presence will go with you, I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring me, uh, bring us up from here. For how shall it be that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Isn't it you being with us that makes us a people? We get our identity from you, God. And the Lord says to Moses, verse 17, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand in, on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. whole bunch of stuff you can dig into. With this passage. Right He's talking about making, God is talking about making his presence pass before Moses. His goodness and glory. And while he's doing it, he's saying, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. He's making a proclamation about his sovereignty and his, his will. He's allowed to do what he wants. That's what he's saying. If I want to be gracious, I get to be gracious. If I want to show mercy, I get to show mercy. And I get to do it on who I want to do it to. And you don't get to say otherwise. Because I... But because of you, because I love you, I'm going to do what you said. I'm going to uh, spare these people. I'm going to let my, my presence go before you. Uh, I'll be with you. Uh, <clears throat> but verse 34, she starts cutting the new tablets. This is where I wanted to... Chapter 34. Yeah, chapter 34. Uh, God tells him, cut new tablets, uh, and then uh, we'll replace the, the first tablets. Um, I'm going to just be meeting with you, not, not the rest of the people. Verse 4. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, and the Lord had commit, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed... The name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh. So again, he's proclaiming his name, and what does he say? The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, 
The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So, how is he describing himself? With hesed, another Hebrew word. Loving kindness, graciousness. This is, again, a central theme all throughout Israel's history of who is God. He is gracious and loving and kind. Abounding in steadfast love, that's has faithfulness. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is essential to who God's character is, what he is like. He forgives sin. But, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. The other essential quality to God's character Yes, he is forgiving and gracious, but he is also just. He will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity on the fathers, on the children, and the children's children, to the third and fourth generations. Justice must be paid. Yeah. This maybe I know this is way off topic, but just something maybe for a future reference or future question. Do you, is that something that is carried on throughout the New Testament? So the, visiting the, iniquity of the of the sins on the, the third and fourth third generation. I no, I don't think so. Okay. I'm just curious. Uh, I don't think so either. But I think this is. A, I think this is a direct reference to the need for a savior. Mm. Right. He will by no means clear the guilty. Well, in a sense, now he has cleared the guilty. But why? Because the iniquity has been paid for. So. He need not visit the iniquity of the father on the children to, to the third and fourth generations because it's been poured out on his own children, mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, it hadn't yet been done, right. so the iniquity was visited. Like I think the terminology that they use nowadays is generational sin. Yeah. 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 That's not to say that, that your own sins can't also affect your kids. Uh, very likely that does happen, yeah. but I don't think it's God visited specifically. Punishing. Yeah. Because you did because it. You it's going to go on to generation to generation. Correct. It's a choice. Yeah. In in the New Testament the the forgiveness has been given. And that only happened because of in the beginning when uh, Adam and Eve uh, taken. Yeah. Uh so these two passages right here, at the end of thirty four and the beginning the end of thirty three and the beginning of thirty four are really dense passages you can draw a whole lot out of them. Things like the cleft of the rock being Christ, uh, the rock on which Moses stood. Uh, Paul talks about that in Corinthians. Uh, and the, the rock that he struck, struck to get the water out of, he also says is Christ. Uh, there are, there's a lot of stuff to go here. Uh, he stands on the rock, his firm foundation, the rock again being Christ. On what do we stand? On Christ, the solid rock do I stand? Uh, to quote a hymn. But... This uh, anyway, th these are these are these are things that tell us about God, right? Matthew six is the last one we're going to look at in depth today, and this is when we start talking about God, Yahweh, Elohim, El, Adonai, as Abba, the Father. So really, uh, do you guys have an outline of Matthew in your heads? How does it start? Matthew 1. What's Matthew famously start with that's really boring and annoying? The genealogy. Yeah. Genealogy. genealogy of Jesus, right? Abraham, the father of Isaac, the father of Jacob, the father of the twelve, Judah. And, but note, how does it start with father? The father of 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 the father of, and then Jesus shows up not too many chapters later, saying, "Our Father who art in heaven." Matthew's doing this on purpose. He starts this off in the Sermon on the Mount, so that's chapters five, six, and seven of Matthew, and this is the first time we really see Jesus preaching at all in the New Testament. Matthew, chapter five. And 
How does he start? Uh, did I make a note on your... I guess I didn't make a note on your pages. Uh, so I'm going to start reading the Sermon on the Mount. You, you stop me when you hear Jesus call God the Father the first time. Starting in chapter 5? Yeah. Okay. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger for the thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those... Son. Yeah, okay, so there's the first, like, allusion to the idea that he's calling God a father, right? They shall be called sons of God. We've got this familial term terminology now for God. Uh, where does he actually first do it? Blessed are those who persecute for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you revile, persecute you, all other kinds of evil, for you, my sake. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven, for they also persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, the salt of lost and saltiness. How shall it be restored? You are the light of the world, the city that you set on the hill, uh, in the same way. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So this is the first time God is called the Father in exactly that word. Uh, this is new to Israel ears. The idea that God would be our dad. And yet, it's the dominant theme throughout all of Christendom for, for God. It, he becomes like the first person of the Trinity as we, we call him. And quite often, we're, we're using sort of Father and God interchangeably and not really making a distinction between the person of the Father and the essence of God. Uh, and Jesus seems to do that throughout here. I mean, he's using the word Father and teaching it to these new people these people who have grown up always just hearing, we call God Yahweh, Elohim, God. Right? That's, that's how it works. Uh, and so, this is what I kept thinking about and wanted us to think about for the last few minutes of our time together. The person of the Father is commonly the one thought of as the generic word God in Scripture. And it sort of starts there with Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. We, we kind of think of God as the Father, and whenever we see the word God, we, we think of the Father, the first person of the Trinity. And then uh, whenever we see Holy Spirit or Son, we think of the other two persons. Uh, is this a good and proper way to think, or is it not? When we see God in the Old Testament, when we see Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, God, should we be thinking of all three persons, or should we be thinking of the Father? What do you think? Um, couldn't it be both? All right, explain. Depending on, like, depending on how it's being used, like, yeah, depending on how you're using it, I mean, it could be both. I mean, you could say, uh, um, I don't know where I was going with that. So, depending on context. Yeah. Okay. What were you going to say, Denise? I was just saying, in the Old Testament, for sure, I think we need to think of it as all three. Okay. Because it's before Jesus has become incarnate. Right. And before the Holy Spirit has come. Descended and, and dwells. Right. Yeah, I would say all three, too. It's based on the fact that it's one essence. So, therefore, what one of the persons says applies to the, yeah. the rest of the Okay. Good. So this is this is the I, I I think this is the right place to start in thinking about this. Of how how do we how do we properly think and distinguish the persons? I will give to what Josh said though. There are some times in the Old Testament where we got to be thinking of a specific person. I think even though just the word Elohim or Yahweh or Adonai is used, uh, there are a few places where it gets a little bit tricky. And so we'll look at those when we get to the problem passages in a week or two. Uh, but
But this is but this is good. I want you to want that to be a realization at the forefront of your mind. Is when you're reading the Old Testament, when you're reading the New Testament, when you, re- when you see the word God, have a firm Trinitarian perspective. Be thinking, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit did this thing. And in less context, I would say a good rule of thumb to go by is unless context clearly distinguishes that there's a different person in view here in the Trinity, then view it as a as a an encompassing term that is talking about all three persons. The the other question to be thinking about, and ho- hopefully you've started thinking about, and we're going to be thinking about more and more, is how are they distinct? And what is the unifying essence of God? Right? What are the attributes that are that are Godness, and what are the attributes of things that are distinct for the Father or for the Son or for the Spirit? Can you think of any of those off the top of your head? What would be a distinct attribute of the Father that the Son does not share? How would you distinguish? How do you distinguish the person of the Father and the person of the Son? Uh, well, like the niece said, one uh, one became incarnate. The other one there you go. Or, there's a or, there's a big one. The father is is not incarnate in human flesh. You might say that the father becomes in uh, becomes takes on physical forms, or you might you might not even say that. But the son is the only one who has taken on human flesh, who has become incarnate. Good. How might you distinguish the Father from the Spirit? What is the something that the, s- the Father doesn't dwell in us? That's yeah, the there you go. The, the Father does not indwell. So, th- what we're drawing on right now is theology that we've grown up and learned, and it's good theology, by the way. But also, I always want you thinking, okay, now how do I know that? How do I know that's true? Well, let's go search the text and see if see if that's in there. And so, yeah, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians one. Philippians 2, Colossians, all of those are passages that would support the Spirit is the one who indwells as distinct from the Father. Yeah, good. What would be a quality that all three share? Being God, yeah, okay. Holiness, good. Timelessness. Timelessness, yeah. Eternality. Sovereignty. Yeah, and uh, so this is, we, eventually we'll be talking about what about the distinct wills of the Father and the Son. That's always a big question in Trinitarian theology. The, the Son says, uh, not my will but thine. So that means they have the, the two persons that share an essence have distinct wills. How does that work? Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So... Hopefully you learned something you weren't too bored. This is Trinitarian theology. If you're engaged with the idea, it's quite compelling. If, But you have to stay with it. And it's easy to just sort of fall off and, and stop listening. Because there's just so many words. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I promise if I had to stay up all night, I would be <laughs> That's fine. I don't, <laughs> I don't blame you. The first time I took God, Christ, Holy Spirit, I failed it. Partly because I broke my ankle that semester and missed a whole bunch of classes. But also because I fell asleep in class a lot because it was really boring. So, uh, I, don't, I don't blame you at all. <laughs> uh, next week, we'll continue with the biblical defense. We'll start looking at the Son and the Spirit. Start digging into the path.